Today, we will learn about Excel for genealogy. I'm your trainer, Lori Coffey. First, we need to know what Excel can do and how to do it. So we'll begin by covering the basics of Excel and the names of the buttons and tools, plus the five steps to building successful databases in Excel. The first basic we'll learn is how to open Excel. It's a little tricky, but easy once you know how. In your Windows computer, down on your taskbar, click the Start button. Depending on which version of Windows you have, it will look something like this. In all apps, search for Excel. I don't have to do that anymore because I have pinned it to my taskbar. Here's how. Once Excel is open, right-click on the icon and select Pin to Taskbar. Now it's always at your fingertips, whether it's open or not. When Excel opens, it offers many options. You can click New or any of the featured templates. Templates are pre-built workbooks to save you design time. They're great if you want that specific type of workbook. When you're new to Excel, they can be cumbersome to change. So we'll stay away from those. We want to keep it simple, sweetheart. So we click Blank Workbook. This is where all the magic happens. I find it's important to learn terms in Excel. After this hour together, we'll, you'll be on your own. I won't be around. And if you need to find an explanation about an Excel button or tool, you'll have a better chance of searching and finding it than if you don't know what it's called. A document in Excel is called what? Here's a hint. <laughs> a workbook. A workbook is made up of tables or worksheets sometimes called spreadsheets or simply sheets. It's useful to use multiple sheets to store data like one for each month or one for each surname or one for each census year. To add more sheets, click the plus sign. Each sheet shows up as a new tab. You can easily rename a tab by double clicking on it and type it in. Right click on a tab for more options like giving it a color for more visibility. Be sure to make them different colors to tell them apart. I've seen people color them all the same. Finally, click and drag the tab to reposition it. A worksheet is made up of cells. Each cell has a name based on where it is. If it's in column A, row one, that cell is called A1. In fact, I could look at the name box here and see where my cursor is. It is in A1. The name box is also a hyperlink that will move my cursor to whatever I type into the name box. For example, XFD 10,458,576. That's kind of an arbitrary number, isn't it? It's the last cell on the sheet. One sheet can probably hold all of your data. But wait, there's more. Each cell can hold 32,767 characters or about 12 pages of single space text. But we're not going to put all our data in one cell. That's not a best practice. We will show you in a bit what is best practice. When it's time for data entry, the formula bar is more important than the cell. Only click in the cell to tell Excel that this is where you want your data to be. Then click in the formula bar to enter the data and see it appear in the cell. Let's watch how the data grows in both places at the same time. When I hit enter to stop, it still shows in the cell. Only when I click back in the cell does it show in the formula bar. See your data in the cell, but enter it or edit it in the formula bar, where you have an easy option to make it bigger. Just click the arrow. I wanna show you one more function before we learn the best practices for building a database. Did you notice that the text spilled into the next cell because there wasn't enough room for it in the column? To adjust the column width, select the line between the columns, then click and drag it. If you have longer text, wrap the text within the column, even if the column is narrow. First, select the column by clicking its name, then click the wrap text button. Because we selected the column first, the wrap text formatting applies to every cell in the column. 
Notice how the row is now higher than the others. That's the trade-off. As a best practice, use drag to make the column the size you want with wrap text buttons so you can see all the data in one cell. <clears throat> Here's a tip. If you see hashtags instead of dates or numbers, Excel is doing you a favor, although it may not seem like one. If there's not enough room to see the completed number, Excel just changes them to hashtags instead of showing a partial number, which could get you into trouble, until you widen the column to see the whole number. Let's look at the ribbon. We'll be visiting there often. The tabs at the top open a boatload of tools like home, which is selected, see the underline? Then see the section like the alignment section. Look for the tab in the section name so you can find the tool we're discussing. For example, under the home tab in the alignment section, click wrap text. Now that you have those basics under your belt, we'll learn the right way to build an effective database. These five best practices will help keep you from having issues in your Excel database. I'll explain each as we go. Before you start to build, think about what data you're collecting that will help answer your research question. We'll help you with that after we learn the five rules. Column headings go in the first row. Enter headings to the right so the data can grow down under it. Here's a memory device to help you remember. If it's going to grow, put it in a row. Excel provides a lot more rows than columns. And if our data might grow as we continue our research, we always want it to grow down. Our number one rule for effective databases is to put your column headings in row one to build the data below. Our second rule is to let Excel know this is a header row by simply bolding it. You can add any other kind of formatting, like making it bigger or in color or italics. But when Excel sees it's bold, it knows, oh, this is a header. This is important for when we do things like sorting and filtering. Number two rule for effective databases is to bold your header row. <laughs> Number three is especially useful for people who are self-taught and have a, built a database or two, but they don't know when you put in a blank row, that's telling Excel that the database is stopped and will only look for data above the blank row or to the left of the blank column. You don't want to confuse Excel, so do not use blank rows. If you want to see all the data with a visual indicator of separation, use a border like a bottom border, which appears at the bottom of the cell row. If you want to actually separate the data, use a filter. This shows you what it does. In a bit, we'll show you how to do it. All right, number four is another rule aimed at experienced Excel users. Sometimes you don't want the content hugging the edge of the cell, especially with numbers but you don't really want it centered either. Like a phone number, you don't want it centered. Often users create a cushion of white by entering two spaces before entering data. The problem with those spaces is Excel can't recognize the data type since there is none. Therefore, that column may act wonky when you're trying to sort or filter and certainly when you're using formulas. Instead of putting something inside the cell that is not data, use formatting instead. In the alignment section, indent is a format tool that you're probably familiar with. In Excel, with one click, it will give you the look of two spaces without entering the wrong type of data. And it only takes one click to turn it off again. So it's quicker to do than all those spaces. Here's the last rule and another for people who might have created databases already, but you newbies are going to learn to do it right before you create your first database. That is to separate data, critical data, such as name and address information, into separate columns. If they're all in one column, it's hard to do a sort or a filter. Simply right-click on the heading to insert a new blank column. The new column is added to the left of the column selected. And then add the new heading. What if you want more than one column? If you want to insert, say, three blank columns, first select three columns, then right click and hit insert. That took me years to learn. Whatever number of columns you select is how many Excel inserts. 
Let's look at those right-click options again. In addition to insert, you can also cut a column, delete a column, or clear the contents or data in a column. At first, you may not think you need it separated, so you don't create it that way. So you start entering data and realize, oops, Lori was right, I do need it separated. This is actually a thing called normalizing your database or separating data into the smallest needed segment. The good thing is, it's a, an easy three-step process to have Excel do it for you, especially useful if you have a lot of data already. Prepare for the process by creating a column for the separate data to go into. What if you have middle names or prefixes like doctor or suffixes like junior? Insert those multiple columns. Otherwise, it will replace what's in the next columns. So always put in extra ones. You can always quickly delete them. Now that we've prepared the database to separate it, I start by selecting the column that I want to normalize. Then we find the three-step wizard or helper under the data tab. In the data tools section on the text to columns button. The wizard asks, how will it know what to separate? I choose delimited and click next. It asks what delimits or separates it. I choose space and click next. It asks where should the data after the space go? The next column is selected by default, so I click finish. That's it. Just rename the headers. I mean, it's really that easy. It's easy to start right and fix it easily when you know how. And you know how now. 